Well, I've been um, uh, teaching this uh, series on uh, rebuilding God's um, altar um, in light of uh, the pandemic. Um, we need to come back and we need to renew our vows and we need to, uh, some of us need to restart. Some, some of us may, may, may have been um, absent for the entire uh, segment of the, of, of the pandemic. And so we need to go back to what we know. And so I know this is basic, but ultimately it is the basics really that keep us in the kingdom. It's not the, it's not the other things, you know. The, 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 the profound things are the basic. Sometimes, uh, um, uh, sometimes I, especially in the application, I'm very simple, you know, very straightforward. And that is because sometimes we, we have to be reminded of the very basic things, right? Like a basketball player has to know the fundamentals. And the, and the football player has to know the fundamentals, right? The golf player has to know the fundamentals. There are some, you know, specific fundamentals that we must have. And so one of the fundamentals of our faith is, uh, is to remove illiteracy of God's word. Mm -hmm. um, today is, is the fifth part. And in fact, if you haven't listened to all the other uh, sermons, um, they are on Facebook. All you have to do is uh, go to Manantial de Amor, um, on, on, I'm sorry, on YouTube and, um, and subscribe if you haven't. Um, and uh, go back and listen to all, all the other um, uh, sermons. Mm -hmm. But it's important to, again, rebuild the altar that belongs to God on which we worship. Because as we rebuild that altar, as we recommit our lives to God, um, He will bless us, bless our lives, bless our homes, our businesses, our jobs, our positions at work. Our church, and it will also um, uh, encourage us as we know God even more, as we worship Him, as we get into the Word of God, particularly. Because in a hundred years, the same um, uh, the same Bible will be speaking to those who will live in a hundred years. I don't plan to be here in a hundred, uh, even if I wanted to. <laughs> that would be an impossible task. So I know that this word of God will be uh, will have the same efficacy as it does with us today. And so we started um, with the basics again, going back to the sacrifice that both Cain and Abel offered to God. That's where we kind of get a, a clue as to what God likes, right? What, what God wants. Mm -hmm. And then we studied Exodus uh, 12 about the Paschal um, Lamb or the Lamb of God uh, um, as, as they sort of, it was sort of a proto prototype of what came later in Christ. You know, he was the perfect Lamb of God. But in Exodus 12, God introduces this idea that it is the blood of a perfect Lamb that, you know, that protected Israel from um, losing their firstborns as, as death came to all the Egyptians and all the Egyptians lost their firstborn. And yet the people of Israel were, were uh, protected because of the blood. They, um, they painted, you know, their doorposts. And so we learned um, that. And it's important because when we come to the altar of God, we are reminded that we come in the name of Jesus. We don't come in our name. Um, we don't come in our, the name of our denomination or the name of our church. Those are, ir those are irrelevant in the, in, in the presence of God. Father, I come in the name of Will Spring Church. I mean, he'll say, what? You know, uh, right? And so, no, we come in the name of his son, Jesus. He gets God's attention, right? Because he, he is the perfect lamb of God. And it is through him that we, co we come to him. Um, and so... And then we move to the importance of God's word. Last time I introduced this, this, this topic of, uh, of the illiteracy of, of the word of God. And today I want to focus more on three basic applications as to how we tackle the word of God. How we study it. How we learn it. How we grasp it. Um, one of the questions that is often asked of people... 
um, is, is do you believe in God? And then the second question is, do you believe uh, the Bible is the word of God? And then there's a third question. I think that this is where a lot of people trip. Do you believe that the word of God or the Bible is the literal word of God? And even evangelicals trip on that. Um, because, again, there is a lot of ignorance. And if there is ignorance of God's word, then there's also lack of faith in it. If people haven't studied, then they don't know that God is speaking to them. And so we have to, we have to deal with the illiteracy of the word of God, first and foremost, right? Again, last time I, we considered um, the consequences of Bible illiteracy. One is the impact. You know, it, it impacts the Christian negatively. It also affects the life of the church. And it destroys society. Meaning that being ignorant of, of the word of God impacts not just us individually. Not just our homes. Not, the, not just the church. But society in General. In fact, there have been studies done um, of, of college students who are read the Ten Commandments before they study something about morality, right? And, and then there are two groups. So this one, this group uh, it, it hears the Ten Commandments, the other group doesn't. And when they, you know, they do the same class, and after that, they ask a number of questions about morality. And guess what? The group that heard the Ten Commandments are the ones that are more aware of how immoral our society is. But the one that doesn't hear the Ten Commandments has no clue. I mean, they, these are secular studies that have been done. And so, so the Word of God it impacts the way we think, the way we act, the way we speak, the way we approach every situation in life. And even society is impacted by, by that. Last time I, I gave at the end two applications. One was to attend VBS and the other was to um, read the Bible every night last week. I'm not going to ask who did it, but I want to encourage you again. If you forgot or you were negligent, do it this week. Read the Bible with your family. Pray with them. All you have to do is open the Bible. Read one chapter. Ask your, your children or your adult children or um, whoever lives with you, what, 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 are they, what, what do they understand the word is saying? What is God saying to them, right? And then you pray on it. And please understand that there are no wrong answers. I mean, when you study, you know, you, you allow the children, if you, were, if you had children, you allow them to just say whatever they want, right? Because over time, they'll get it. That's what we did. We were just allowed them. We would, we would giggle, right? Like, Man, that's a heresy, but hey, we'll pass it this time, right? Uh, but, you know, it's, over time, they get it, right? They get it. The point is that we have to stay on it to really um, teach the Word um, of God. And so it's important to study, to, 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 to read it first and foremost, and to think about it. You know, what is God saying to us? All right, so let's tackle then... Uh, uh, three ways um, uh, how to remove illiteracy of the Word of God. Um, the first one is that we need to study the Bible with others. Kind of like what, you know, what uh, Telios does, right? Mm -hmm. We need to study the Bible with others. Because guess what? We don't, we don't all grasp the Word in the same way. There is a difference between me doing a sermon and, 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 and then discussing it with others. Somehow, when I discuss it with others, it's like I have 10 sermons in just a conversation. Why? Because in, 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 the, in the group, there is this anointing in God's presence to speak in us, to us, and through us. Only those faithful Christians uh, who acknowledge um, the mutual edification... Uh, Intentionally study the, the, the word of God with others. Look at Hebrews 3.12, please. Turn with me. Hebrews tw uh, 3, uh, verses 12 through 14. It says, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, 
that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ if, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Notice what, what, what this passage is saying. It is saying that those who are faithful encourage one another. We must encourage one another to stay in the word. When someone is absent, we need to call them. We need to text them. We need to say, hey, we missed you, right? And in some ways, where are you, right? Or maybe visit them. Go and find them. Go and look for them and encourage one another. We need to encourage one another that no one will, will fall by, by the sideways. We need to stay together. Mm -hmm. Faithful Christians understand that all we have all we have is today. That's what, that's what this passage is saying. That today, God called you today. He, God is not planning to call you tomorrow. And He will call you, but He's planning to call you today. He wants to talk to you today. He wants you to understand His word today. He wants you to uh, grasp what, his, what the meaning of His word is today. In fact, the only thing that we have guaranteed is the, the next breath. That's it. Breathe with, breathe with me. That's the only guarantee we have. My mother-in-law, as we were driving this morning, said, she said, son, there, there are no guarantees in this life. And she said, look at you. Yesterday you were running, you were jogging 30, 45 minutes, you know, and, 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 and now you can barely do 30 minutes of a walk. Life changes like that. There's no, there are no guarantees. There are opportunities, but not, no guarantees. See? We have today. It is today that we have. We have today to, to study the Word of God. Today to come to church. Today to do right. Today to love our family. Today to love God. But we don't know tomorrow. It is today that we have. Let's go to Hebrews 10. Look at Hebrews 10, uh, verses uh, 24 and 25. 10, 24, and 25. It says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as it is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and in all the more as you see the day drawing near. Jesus is Coming. Jesus is returning. And we, we, we see the signs. Not that, we, not that we live our life purely by those signs. But we know that the, coming, the, the Lord is coming. We know. This pandemic is proof of that. And there will be much, many more. Not just uh, this, this monkey pox. And, uh, there will be pox after pox. And pan pandemic after pandemic. There will be a lot more viruses going around. And if we value that much more than God, we'll be afraid, I tell you. We must understand that we need to encourage one another to do good works in love. Not to buy the grace of God, but to demonstrate that the, that the grace of God is in us. Not neglecting to, meet, to be together. I, I applaud those uh, Telios, who, you know, Telios, Telios members who got together. Stay on it, you guys. Stay on it. Study the word of God. The Hebrew uh, uh, writer uh, exhorts us in both passages to be careful uh, not to allow our hearts to, to, be, to harden. You know what, what happens over time? That when we ignore the word of God, our hearts get hardened. Um, how many of you have paid um, a, um, you know, a, a gym membership? And anyone has paid a gym membership? We have two, three, four, quite a few, many more here in the English service. I'm glad the Latino brothers on the other side are like, you know, one or two. But here, quite a few of you. You know, you guys who have had a, a membership understand that, you know, you, in January, we all are excited, right? And we're going, <laughs> huffing and buffing. In January, February, you know, February, we are, we're only doing one hand. And March, we're only just, you know, barely doing. April, we're absent. May is Mother's Day. June is Father's Day. July is vacation month. And August, who cares? <laughs> right? 
That, that's, isn't that the, that's, that's the pattern, right? Why? Because our muscles get, get hardened. The, if you want to stay in shape, you got to stay in shape. If you want to look good, you got to go back to that gym, hit that gym time and time again. And the same thing happens to your faith. The same thing happens to your word. If you want to be rooted in God, you have to stay on it every single day. Because Jesus already paid for your membership. Don't waste it. Don't get your heart uh, become hardened. See, we, we have to get in, in the word of God. The word of God always softens the heart. Have you noticed that when we read the word of God, we're much more obedient. We're more productive. We're, we're better at our work. The car stays cleaner and we don't kick the dog as much. When we read the word of God, something happens to us when we read the word of God. It's like life gets a little more exciting, more bearable, more tolerable. See? He says to be careful not to allow our hearts to get hardened. And then he says, consider, you know, consider how to encourage one another. Consider. In other words, we not only need to be in, in, in good shape, we also need to tell, hey man, come to the gym with me, right? Let's, let's, let's study the word of God. Come to Telios. Come to church. We need to encourage other people. See? If we preserve our life as our priority, instead of studying the word of God with others, like this pandemic has shown, then these passages are for you. Sadly, the, the pandemic, I think, manifested our fears, our worst fears. You know? The pandemic, I think, manifested who cares more about the physical body than the spiritual life. The pandemic, I think, manifested how afraid we are that, that a virus can kill the body. But we're not afraid of the one who can sell the, the, the soul, who can send the soul to hell. We must be much more concerned with God. We must be Afraid or, 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 or concerned, moved by God. You know, we're not, not, we need to tremble in, the, in His presence. Not come lightly to God. God is not your buddy. He ain't your friend either. I mean, He's your friend in, in, in terms of how you relate to Him. But He's not going to, you know, hey, He doesn't high five you. I mean, He's God. When we come to Him, we come with reverence. See? I think oftentimes we, we, we are afraid, you know, of, of other things. And we don't, we don't, we're not, we don't fear God as much. One of the reasons I stay, every service I attend, whether it is here or somewhere else, I, I, I stay to the end. I really stay to the end. And I stay to the end because when I preach, I want everyone who's hearing me. To stay to the end. Well, I mean, that's what my mom said. She said, if you, if you want to, if you, you know, if, if you want people to stay to the end, then you stay to the end. If you don't like the sermon, stick it out. Stay on it. Mm -hmm. we, need to, we need to be concerned with the word of God. Much more than all the pressures of this world. In our congregation, we have community groups. Every week, every, you know, every, every week, uh, community groups get together, both, both Spanish and English. And I'm glad that we have, we're, we're promoting more English-speaking um, um, uh, groups. We need to get together, come together. Like I said before, you will never be a fanatic enough. You will never. Forget it. You, you, will, ne you, you will never be, a, a, you know, a... a, a a streak of, 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 of a Jesus lover. Forget it. No, you, you just love him as much as you can. We can never have enough of Jesus. We can never have enough of the word. That's the only word. This is the only word that you can eat tons and tons and you never get fat. You know? It, it strengthens your muscles. It, it encourages you. It helps you stay on, you know, on cue in life. Hmm? And so we need to take care of our souls by coming together with other people. We must 
Study the word of God with others. See? And if that's not enough, we have two me here on, on, you know, on location. And we have also Harvest Bible University. I mean, there are, we, we are spoiled, you guys. Our church is spoiled. We have two great institutions right here in walking distance. And not only that, but we, we have an array of, you know, of, of places or of things that we can do to study the Word of God. We are spoiled in that sense, you guys. You got to give credit to Pastor Robina who had that, you know, that, you know, that thinking of how to, how to equip, equip the church, right? We have foundations to introduce us both to our identity in Christ, our responsibility as, as local members of the congregation, uh, be able to identify our gifts, and also be able to share our faith. I mean, those things are studied here. They're not in depth. But they're fundamental enough that every new believer can go and take those classes and, and kind of get his feet wet, right? So not only do we need to study the, the Word of God with others, but listen, if you are a parent, you need to teach the Word of God to your children. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, 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 a mother who um, read the, the Bible every Every night to her children. And so, um, you know, early in the, in the year, um, she, she studies um, Genesis and goes, you know, through the entire Bible all the way to um, Revelation um, by, by Christmas and New Year. And so, this year, she kind of went a little more in-depth about the story of Adam. You know, how God created Adam and Eve and so forth and... So one evening she uh, comes to little Johnny and uh, little Johnny is, is, is kind of, you know, bending a little bit. And, and mom asks, hey, Johnny, what's going on? And he says, oh, mom, I have this pain right here on my ribs. He said, oh, what do you think the Lord is doing with that? And, you know, she was trying to relate it back to the word of God. And he says, well, I think that tomorrow when I wake up, I'm going to have a wife. Right? His little mind was thinking already how to connect the word of God. Okay, that's heresy, but let, let, let it, that's all right. <laughs> that's all right. See? But we need to teach the word of God to our kids. I remember when, when we, um, when, when we, our kids were born, we first, the first Bible was like, you know, these book, you know, these uh, uh, pictures, right? Remember going through, all, you know, the, the, the stories of the Bible with the pictures. We would kind of, you know, not read them, just come up and, you know. And they would be fascinated by the, by the pictures. You, you, we, get, we had full attention from them every single time. We would sit with them. Uh, Charisma, uh, uh, even Joey, as he was a baby, we, we, we read, you know, we kind of gave him the, you know, these stories, right? And over time, they got, you know, when they started attending kindergarten and first grade, second grade, then we, we promoted them to a, a Bible that was very simple to read. And we would read it with them. At first, we, we read it with them. You know, we just kind of coaching them on that because they couldn't read it by, by themselves. And, and, and then they became teenagers. And we got a, a, a version for teenagers. And now they're adults. Now they have a, a, an ESV. See? And one of the things that we do every single day, whether it is Monday, Saturday, or Sunday, whether we've been so busy on vacation, whether we've been busy doing stuff, at the end of our day, there's a question that no one escapes from. Did you read the Bible today? That's the question. Did you read the Bible? You know? And then, what did you understand the, the Bible is saying? That's the second question. And then the hard one is, how does that apply? That's the hard one, right? How does that, how, how do you integrate Bible knowledge into your life? But we, we have to be thinking like that, see, with our, with our children. God has given us parents that enormous responsibility and privilege to, to form these young lives. Look at uh, Proverbs 22, 6. You're familiar with this passage, but it says, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, let me ask you a question. Who knows 
the way a child should go? Who knows the way a child should go? The parents do. Say it with boldness. Parents. Not the child. The child doesn't have a clue about life. The child, the child is just a little, he, he came already a sinner. He hasn't even finished college and yet he's a professional sinner. He knows how to lie. He knows how to manipulate. He's a sinner. I often remind my kids about that. I, I, I tell them, you know, you're as, you are as a, a professional of a sinner as, I, as, as your dad is. We already came with credentials from the womb. No one, taught, no one teaches us how to lie. No one teaches us how to manipulate. And it, a child from the very beginning knows how to lie and how to manipulate. Just put him together to play. And give him his favorite toy. You will see quickly how, quick, how, how the fight is started like that. See? The child doesn't know. But the parents know the way a child should go. There's, there's this philosophy that the, the, the child determines his life and his future. Well, today, as they say in school, the child determines his sexuality. Who knows about his sexuality? In that case, the child knows already. But the parents have to remind that child. Right? God made you a boy. Now, in school, you, you're going to hear that you have to decide, but don't worry about it. They're dumb, but you're smart. Uh, dumb, dumb people that think that they're smart, but they're just a bunch of idiots. But you are smart, my son. You're a boy. You know, don't, don't get me into that conversation. That's, that's very important to, to say it. And to, to reiterate that again and again. The parents know the way of the child, not the child. And you have to be bold from the get-go to, to know where the child... And I'm not saying that you will decide what career. That, that will come in time. At three years old, you're not going to choose his wife. Wait until he gets 30. Okay, now in our days, it's 30. Just wait. Give him 30 more years. Right? But the parent, the parents are the ones who know the way a child should go. And look, this passage says that, that, that it, it, it explains the results. Listen, the results of the parents. The second part says, even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, this could be a promise. Or it could be simply the product of the work of the parents. I believe that in this case, for application purposes, it is the byproduct of whatever you do with your child. The child... The child knows what mom and dad is saying. He'll go back again and again. He'll give weight to mom and dad over whatever he hears out of school or from his friends or on media. He'll always go back to what mom and dad say. He'll believe more mom and dad. But we must, again, be bold in, 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 you know, in, in leading our children with the word of God. It is our privilege, you guys. I have already two adult kids still living at home, by the way. Uh, they, either, they're, they're, they stay at home either because we pay their rent or because they love us. Uh, I think it's both. I think it's both. Hopefully. We'll see. We'll, right? But, but, but we, we have this opportunity. And notice, please, notice. That the, the responsibility doesn't end when they become teenagers and they, they go, they finish high school. They keep hearing the same thing from, from mom and dad. Now, we don't treat them as children, right? We treat them, treat them as adults, but we remind them the same thing. We keep telling them the same thing. Remember what the Lord says. Okay? Why do we say that? Because mom and dad cannot be there. I don't know what they do when they go to school. They tell me what they do. I don't know. I, I only see the final grades. That's, that's how I know they attended. But as far as I'm, you know, I'm concerned, they might as well just go to Vegas the, the entire weekend. And I don't know. I have to trust them. Like, yeah, Dad, I'm here typing away. No. They're in, you know. I don't know. I, I trust them. I have to trust them, right? 
But listen, listen. What I know is that I'm not there. But God is there. God is there to see you. God is there to watch you. God is there to see if you are obeying your mom and dad and obeying the word of God. God is there. And if I give them this word, this word, if I give them the word of God, I know that they will have to cope with that. But hey, they're going to have to deal with that. Not mom and dad. One day, one day, I'm not going to be daddy and mommy. Well, we're not going to be daddy and mommy. Mommy. We're not going to be there every single time they get a high fever. We, we won't any longer. They'll have to figure it out themselves. Right? But what's important is that, that they will have the word of God in their hearts. Now listen. We also need the right attitude. Right? To teach our, our children. We don't just, you know, we're not, just, we, we shouldn't come to them assuming that we know, know everything. I mean, I'm a, I'm a professional preacher. I mean, if, if by all by all, you know, uh, determination, I, I'm a professional preacher. Yeah, I, I get that. I, you know, I, I went to school to do this, right? But the fact is that I don't know everything. And I, I, I shouldn't act as if I know the mind of God. What I know and I should teach my children is the Bible. That's all I know. And you know what? That suffices. But we have to have the right attitude. Look at, look at what uh, um, Ephesians 6.4 says. Fathers. And by fathers, I think we mean mom and dad, right? Do not provoke your children to anger. But bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, look at what, what the Bible is saying. You can actually provoke someone to anger. And I can explain that to you. For those of you who are, have been married for a while, you know that when your spouse is mad, man, you don't, you don't want to solve the problem at that point. You're going to make it worse. And if you by now haven't learned that lesson, man, <laughs> I don't know what I can do for you, but you gotta, you, you, that's, that's just one lesson you have to learn. The worst time to solve a problem is when you're mad or your wife is mad. Or your, your spouse, your husband is, is mad. If, if your husband is, 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 is angry, don't tell him, oh, there you go, you're angry again. No, it's, you're going to make it worse. Because the worst thing that an ang anger, angry person wants to hear, that he's anger, angry. So don't state the obvious. Don't state the obvious. Don't state the obvious. We know that, right? We're smart, right? We're smart here, but not here in our hearts. And so the same thing happens to children. You know, we, we don't solve the issues. We don't correct ch children when we're mad, when we're angry. Sometimes I have to restrain myself. Joey, go get the trash is still inside. He gets up and goes and, and, and does it. I don't want to see the trash. When, when mom is here, when mom arrives, the trash should not be there any longer. Right? And then the second time, I say, hey, boy, pick it up. Go, get, get, do your stuff. Right? Now, now I'm mad. Right? Thankfully, they're obedient. That's, 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 the, that's the advantage we have. But, 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 but Peter, I'm not going to correct him. I'm not, I, that is the wrong time to tell him, how I told you. Right? He won't get it. Just as the husband, the spouse, or the, the wife doesn't get it. When, you know, when, when, when the wife is mad, don't, don't make it worse. Just chill out and say, yes, love. Yes, love, I get it. Don't, don't even say you're mad. Just say, yes, honey, sweet pie. I love you so much. I understand my love. Yeah. You know. Help her land. Right. Help her. The same thing with your children. You know when your children are mad. When, you're, when they're mad, do you think they're going to listen to you? Seriously? Do you think they'll listen to you and they say, Yeah, dad, I get it. Yeah, right now I'm going to be, I'm going to be, obey you, you, you precisely because I get it. And that's not what children do. I mean, for that matter, you're an adult and you don't get it when you're mad. We don't get it. When we're, you know, and that's what the Bible is saying. It's saying, do not provoke your children to anger. Why? Because you're going to lose their hearts. And it says, but instead, bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. In other words, in other words, if you are upset 
what you can do is calmly say, remember what the word of God says. And you can say it calmly. And they'll be much more uh, concerned and much more uh, fearful of God than you are, than, than of you. Believe me. So we must have the right attitude to teach them the word of God. Don't just be, don't, don't get preachy on them. Don't do 30 minutes of a sermon. And then, and then you look at your children and they're like, you know, they're in la la land. Because you're like your 30 minute sermon. Kids don't learn that. It's five, ten minutes. It's a quick, you just, you, you go fast and, you, you know, you read something. You say, what, what, what you learn? What you learn? What you learn? Okay, all right, you didn't learn anything. Okay, but let's pray. That's it. Don't make it. So. Now, over time, over time, then, you know, as, as they start grasping the, 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 the word of God, then you, then you have those discussions, right? Mm -hmm. We should not teach our children through anger, but in love. We should instruct them. Instead of, of dictating what, what we feel, we need to be instructing them in the word of God. Creating them, to create in them fear for God. Mm -hmm. How much I would like to see more men, especially in our church, teaching our children in Sunday school. I'd love to, do, to see that. Children need to see men, particularly. And, and I think in every culture, for some reason... Men have a, you know, we have a hard time, I think, for whatever reason, to stay on it. But I encourage, especially the males, let's stay on the word of God. Don't abandon that responsibility to your mom. If mom helps, praise God for that. And in, 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 our, in, our, in our home, I, 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 I take the lead. And that's been the case for all these years but let's provide leadership in that mm -hmm. we ought to study the scriptures with others and we need to teach it teach it to our uh, our children but we also need to have a daily devotional and i left this for last because i want us to understand how important it is to have time with god a blessed life is anchored in the daily nourishment of the Word of God. If you want to be happy, if you really want to be happy, you got to get in the Word daily. Not that that's the goal of life, right? But if you truly are motivated, there's a, there's a, there's a very um, you know, personal motivation. The Word of God makes you happier. Look at Psalm 1, verses um, 1 um, through 3. Let's go to uh, Psalm, the first Psalm in the Bible, Psalm 1. Look what it says. Psalm 1, verse 1 says, Blessed is the man, and by man meaning the person. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Let's pause there. The word blessed is, is in the Hebrew is esher. Um, for the Hebrew mind, listen, for the Hebrew mind, to be happy is to be, to be correct. To be upright. For the Hebrew mind, that's what it means. If you want to be happy, you have to be, you have to walk uprightly. That's, that's what for the Hebrew mind. And that's, that's why it's, it says here that blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. See? Esher. For that reason, in fact, to the, the, the word righteous. Now, blessed is Esher. Now, righteous is Eshar. Just one, one, one vowel. It separates the two, but the two are related. See, if you, if you read the, the, the original um, uh, Hebrew, you will find that righteous is the word eshar. See, so the, a righteous person is a happy person. And a happy person is a righteous person. See? In other words, whoever wants to be happy must be righteous. If you want to be happy... Be righteous. The problem today is that sometimes we don't feel righteous because we're not doing things righteously. 
We're behaving like the world. And, you know, and so no wonder, no wonder people, you know, Christians sometimes go through ups and downs in their faith or walk away because they're not walking in righteousness. They're not seeking righteousness. And by righteousness, I'm not saying that you don't stumble. By righteousness, I mean that you seek the word and you seek God and you stay on it and stick it out and wait for God to help you overcome those things that you cannot overcome in your own strength. See? We, if, if we want happiness as a result, we have to be righteous. And to be righteous, you must not take the advice of the wicked or be close uh, friends with sinners. Or sit down to talk to, uh, you know, about your problem with the scoffers. That's what it's saying. Then instead of going to those people, you need to come. I think that we, we can assume that the opposite is true. That if you come and, 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 and stay around a wise person, you'll become wiser. And that's one thing that this generation doesn't teach. Wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to consider the outcome of a decision. That's one way of looking at wisdom. Is when you are making a decision, you're already thinking, this is what's going to happen if I decide this. That's wisdom. But this generation doesn't want to talk about wisdom. Because they're not thinking about the outcome. They're just thinking about me, myself, and I. My rights. My privileges. Right? And it's found in verse 2. Verse 2 says, but he, but it says, but, but it, His delight is in the law of the Lord. And on the law he meditates day and night. Notice the contrast. The righteous uh, do not seek advice from the wicked. By daylight. um, uh, You know. know, In in, in daylight. But they seek the word of God. Instead of going out after. You know. The the righteous after he comes back. Or she or he or she come. come, You know. Come back after. um, uh, They uh, they don't go and do bar hopping. Or go and have two tequilas to take the edge off. No. They go and study the word of God. See. See. The person of righteous living is not a friend of sinners by day, nor he delight he, he does not delight either with covers by night, but he meditates the comm- and the commandments of God day and night. Mm-hmm. They do not dream uh, that in the future they will retire and finally they will give time to the word of God. Some of, some of you are thinking that way. Oh, one day I will retire and I'll give all my time to God. Lying to yourself. How, how, do, how, do we, how do we then, then practice righteousness? Well, we, we, we obey the Lord. Mm-hmm. And we study his word. And through his word, we discover his plans and purposes. Mm-hmm. We're not concerned. Listen, the upright is not concerned about his future. Because we know that the future is in the hands of God. Not in our hand. In fact, you can make the best decisions. You can marry the right, the perfect person. You can attend the, you know, the, 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 the perfect church. But, but, but it, there's no guarantee that everything will be perfect for you. Some of my buddies have married good people and ended up in divorce. Some parents are good parents and yet they have bad children. And I want to say too that some bad parents have good children. But, you know, so the future is not in our hands. Rather, the future that listen, the, the future is not a product of dreaming. That one day, one day, I'm going to give time to the Word of God. One day, I will attend church. One day, I will accept Jesus. One day, I will be faithful to my wife. One day, no, 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 no. Listen, the future is not the product of a dream. The future. It's the consequence of meditating in the Word of God day and night. See, when you meditate in the Word of God, the Word of God takes care of your future. God is already working. If you are aligning yourself to Him, He'll take care of you. Okay, He will take care of you. I don't know how that happens, but He will. If you want to take, you know, take things into your own hands, that's fine. But it won't go well with you. Look at verse 3. He, he, is, he is 
like a tree planted by streams of water. Talk about drought, right, in California. He's planted like a tree by, by the streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. And its leaves do, does not, his leaf does not wither. And all that he does, he prospers. This believer has, it's, it's like planted next to a, a stream of water. Not to a, right, not to a, not to a, a, a raging um, river, but, but streams of water. You know. He nourishes his life with the, wor- with the word of God. The good water. His leaves do not wither, meaning that his children, his family, his, his work, his whatever, whatever he you know belongs to him does not wither. See? And all he does, he prospers. In other words, he, this, this person is not looking for to have success. Success is a byproduct of meditating in the word of God. It's a result of, not. If you pursue right, if you pursue uh, success, it's not going to go well with you. I tell you, as the end, you know, the end result of success is quite the opposite. You can end up be- being very rich after three divorces and children sp- scattered all over, right? But when you are, when you meditate in the Word of God, the belongs to you that God has placed under your care does not wither it stays there righteous parents are loved by their children kids want to be with their parents they want to have dinners with them they they want to they want to go to dad and say dad can you give me this console or can you advise me on this and daughters seek the you know mom's advice when, when there's righteousness in the in the home but quite the opposite when there is not kids don't visit anymore they even forget about your birthday for that matter Do you want to rebuild the altar of God in your hearts? Then you must incorporate meditating daily on the word of God. Stay on it. Stay on it. One thing I love to do is I, we, we, in, in, our, in our home we, we have um, this little deck out in the back. And we have some chairs and a hammock. But I sit on the chair and open the word of God and read it. And read it a little more. And read it. And read it. And I laugh with God. And I'm sure that he laughs at my jokes as well when I'm praying. And the greatest things that God has talk, talked to me and told me to do have happened during those times. When I open the word. And he's more directed. See. I love those times. Seriously. And when I was a teenager, I remember my mom forced me to read the Bible. And I didn't like it. But over time, it got better. Right? If you keep salt, eat salting things eventually, you're going to love every, everything salty. And that's what happens over time. The word grows in you. See? See? It's not, you you start thinking the way you think about the world and the way you speak to people and the way you address others. The word flows naturally. And as you are addressing someone, even an atheist or agnostic or a co-worker or someone who is broken, someone who is in pain, you're able to talk to them in a way that is uplifting and encouraging and transforming because the word is in you. Your blessedness flows out of you into the heart of your hearers. Mm-hmm. A blessed life is anchored in the systematic practice of the Bible and of the systematic reading as well. A daily devotional that incorporates Bible reading brings you closer to God every single time. Daily Bible reading gradually increases increases your understanding of, of God's word. Now listen, listen. This in some ways 
Some things about this book are easy to get. And some things are hard. Some things are difficult. I mean, it's taken me years. It's taken a degree in theology to grasp some of it. Man, it's taken long. And the fact that I understood it intellectually didn't mean that I, I understood what God meant. It's taken time. So gradually, as you read more, you grasp understanding, you start understanding the heart of God. Reading the scriptures produces peace, strength, and hope. It all starts with the funda- fundamentals. If you want to study it, you have to read it. Are you willing to do your part in getting rid of Bible illiteracy in your life? Then consider having that devotional every single day.